Hey, Brainiacs, quick note before we get into this episode. Sharon Blady is joining me today to talk about Ant-Man Quantum Mania, and as we often do, the cultural and psychological implications of that story. Speaking of story, we are sticking very closely to discussing the story and things as they are presented in the movie. We are not really talking about Jonathan Majors and the scandal. For anyone who doesn't know, there has been uh, some allegations and some criminal charges having to do with domestic violence type charges. I'm not going to recap any of that or get into it because we are not experts in that area. That's a legal matter for Mr. Majors. He's very pivotally involved in the upcoming phases for Marvel. No idea what Marvel or Disney are going to do. Uh, This is just a disclaimer to say that, of course, Uh, We stand with any survivors of any violence. Sharon and I are both big believers of that. And at the same time, believers that whatever process is in play should play out. So uh, no worries if we don't get into that. Now you know why. (laughs) So please enjoy our analysis of the movie Quantum Mania. The Broken Brain. Recording in progress. I very nearly just clicked on end. That would have been bad. Ooh, <laughs> Although that's you not what second. we're looking for. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why. I was like, let me click on record. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the world's shortest podcast. It never happened. The end before the record button. <laughs> the shortest episode in the history of The Broken Brain. That's one of my favorite things about reality shows, by the way, is when they say, this is the this is the most dramatic thing that's ever happened in the history of Project yeah. Red. You know, as if it's like, yeah. As, as if this thing. is some big historical the thing history. in in general. Like, as if the show, it's it, as if it, as if it matters in the big picture. That's what we're going to, archaeologists are going <laughs> right. to find this 5,000 years later. Okay. <laughs> oh, Sharon, how are you? Great to have you here. Oh, there. Good, wherever. good, good. Um, excited about this. I have to say, I really enjoyed Quantum Mania, and it was one that I, um, you know, it was, again, so much fun. So, no, it's been busy, busy times, and really grateful for. Um, the Marvel breaks that I've had along the way. So that and and then Guardians, which we can talk about later. Yeah, have we're going to do one like, on that really too. Super Exciting. cool high points. Yeah, these so. are both these are both very high points. I would say, uh, well, well, you know, we'll talk about that one when we're on that. And Guardians a little more for me, but but Quantum Mania also, as I believe the first movie in Phase Five. Right. Yeah. I think. Oh, and this is it. And I have to admit, sometimes I lose track of the phases. Yeah, like, yeah. Just, you know, between, no, yeah. between that and, and Star Wars, where you're like, okay, I got to look up a timeline because I'm not sure. But, well, I think <laughs> you and I, I think you and I are uh, alike in this. You could call me a stan for Marvel, I guess, or really. But the thing is, I'm actually, I've actually gotten to a point in my life where almost everything that I consume, media wise. Almost, not everything, but almost everything I find I'm like looking for the things that are enjoyable. And I just got to this point where I'm like, you know, people making a creative endeavor, I'm in, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, I see what if I can see what you were trying to do, even if it didn't totally work and you took a swing, I'm, I'm just very, you know, so if anybody, you know, if anyone's tuning in to be like, oh, we're going to bust on this thing, it's, it's not that kind of show, obviously. And, and for me, so much <laughs> of it is just the fact that they're exploring it because it's already... Yeah. A rich universe, and and then I think, and the, also the take that I I the approach that I take, it's similar to when I think of things like, um, well, Neil Gaiman is another one where it's the the book said this, but the TV show or the movie did that, and it's this idea that you know it's about mythology, and there's always more than one version of the myth, and well, and so and that yeah. they evolve, and that you have different iterations and different versions, and yes, there's the one that we might be most familiar with, but in terms of what's canonical. And that's kind of what I like about, again, the the MCU, like Marvel in general, because, I mean, we already have that in, in comics just with the multiverse by its very nature. Absolutely. Um, but then also this idea yeah. of, you know, going into the MCU and going, okay, well, actually, we can do these other things. Yeah. And, and that it, it makes, I would say it makes Marvel more accessible yeah. because it allows to gloss over. And I think the one thing that I still love, and I think this is a, a good example of it, is that you can watch Marvel movies without... You can literally bring somebody who's never seen anything in the franchise, walk them into one of these movies, and they're without knowing the huge backstory, can still understand the movie. And yeah, I think that's I think one of the things that I like, as opposed it, to uh, something where you're like, 
again, I found myself, Star Wars is a good one, where I didn't go down all the animated paths the way my kids did. And now I find myself sometimes in the middle of watching like The Mandalorian. Who the what? What are they? Oh, my God. Hold on. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Oh, that was from, you know, this side side quest or this other thing. So that's what I love about this one is it's yeah. rich. It's complex. It's a lot of backstory um, and a lot of character development around family. And it has. And, and especially uh, like regret. <laughs> yes. It has and, also and do-overs. the element to just from a narrative standpoint, for me, just like you say, the MCU is now its own storyline. Just like if there was a new artist and writer for Ant-Man or for Daredevil or whatever, they launch a new storyline that may or may not touch on the others. And there's certain continuity that is there, but not always. So I look at the MCU as just another run, of, as mm -hmm. we would call it in the comics yeah. world. So, yeah, it's and another run, and it allows people to sort of play in different sandboxes. And, and what I have to say to that, too, is when I think about, again, and it, it, to me it just it shows growth and development – um, which actually is sort of one of the themes of this movie. There's always room to grow. Um, <laughs> one of the lines there is, is this idea that, you know, when you think about like, for example, uh, Iron Man, the first one out of the gate, you know, it's, there's some character development stuff there, but it is really just a straight superhero movie. Mm -hmm. It's about the, you know, the big explosions. Yes. You have Tony Stark having his aha moment, but there, and, and there's certain things about relationships, but you realize when you get to something like this, just the maturity that's occurred mm -hmm. within Marvel and the MCU in terms of, yeah, like this movie is about family. Mm -hmm. This movie is about regret. It's about change. It's about what if it's about what I've missed out on, what I'm trying to catch up on. So you see all the different parenting and grandparenting things go on. You also see the edging around communication around what, you know, oh, I didn't think it was important to tell you this. Well, now that we're uh, knee deep in a conqueror and uh, the quantum realm, um, yeah, that would be a cool, you know, and, well, and the fact that it's even done in the context, I still love the whole scene where, you know, after the Bill Murray scene and you have the, you know, blah, 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 I had needs and there's just the hope thing and, you know, oh, well, blah, 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 I went out with this woman, Linda, and you're like, no, 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 I don't need that. So it was this combination of you've got the humor of, right. you know, kid listening to parent but at the same time you've got the parents catching up on communication and oops did i, I didn't mention this because it wasn't really important it didn't change you know she wasn't you that kind of thing yes. and at the same time kid la 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 <laughs> yeah. interesting really, we're yeah. talking about that now <laughs> very, and, and getting into the relationships you know that's a very interesting exchange you mentioned and as always when we talk about these things this is meant to be an analysis uh primarily for those who have either seen this or don't care so much about spoilers because yeah. <laughs> uh, spoilers abound um yeah at the point where they are and they're in the midst of running around and um you get Hank and uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's character. Oh, my gosh. Uh, what is her name? Janet. Janet. There we go. Janet, yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the other part. We finally get to see her and get her whole backstory yeah. and just the whole, ooh, okay, yeah, so 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 grandma does have some baggage around this and yes. she's not really comfortable with what she did and, you know. I was just happy to be back. It didn't was, think it was going to bleed out, so didn't feel it, the need to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, it was fascinating to see that little exchange between them where uh, – and I think – I think that we expect them to really play up certain aspects in movies where it's like, okay, now here's the part where Hank gets jealous. And not that there wasn't a touch, but interestingly enough, when he says to her, like, that guy? And she's like, hey, I was alone for 30 years. And he's like, it's not, that's not the problem. I just, that guy sucks, <laughs> basically. And both of them acknowledge, like, yeah, we were apart for 30 years and you thought I was dead. And I, you know, I thought I was trapped here for life. And we moved, you know, there, there were certain aspects that they immediately, um, forgave is not the right word, but just accept about each other's experience. It's, it's, right? it's like it's irrelevant. We were in totally different places, yeah. never thought we were going to see each other again. So we literally accepted. The situation and, we were in and moved on accordingly and it doesn't mean anything in the con it wasn't you know a conscious act of cheating yeah you know sneaking out the back right. door it on wasn't anything end. like that at all and there was an immediate like acceptance of each other's situation support and it reminds me one of the things that marvel can definitely be accused of just like any of these comic book storylines is mm. if someone's happy if someone says it's good to have friends or I love you 3000 or something like that, that's a death sentence, right? Usually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And particularly okay. or if we've just had the foreshadowing that there <laughs> yeah. within the next five to eight minutes, something really <laughs> awful is going to happen. 
And, uh, you know, especially if they commit the cardinal sin of falling in love with someone, that means that, you know, one or both of them. And so when you have preserved families, you know, and I've said on here when we've talked before, you got Hawkeye's family, you've got the the one family in the Eternals, um, mm-hmm. the Brian e. Green's character. And then, uh, you know, and you've got Ant-Man. And one of the things that was a real strength in the Ant-Man franchise that they started in the first one and really hit hard in the second one was the reconciliation and the acceptance and love that can happen uh, between former partners and even between a step parent and the and a biological parent mm-hmm. who is the ex of his partner to see how long, how well they not in the beginning of Ant Man they have yeah. beef there but yeah they, you have to work through it yeah, yeah <laughs> but and, they get and, there you know the Ant Man one ends with Scott thanking his daughter's stepdad for all that he's done as he tried to mm-hmm. save her right and then in the second one they they have a friendship type relationship all yeah. th- all three of them well, right? and, and, and the recognition that neither of them is the inherent bad guy for whatever thing like yeah. one is not the failed father who doesn't love his daughter and then sure. the other one is not the person that's an interloper and you know yeah. and those, those stereotypes well and I think that was the other part that again like and you saw this right from the beginning that whole opening scene and him giving all that that backstory and talking about the work that hope does so the, the other thing too was he was like, here's a secure male that can sit there and talk about effectively how, oh my God, I'm not sure how I ended up with this woman who is so wonderful, so this and that. Mm-hmm. And 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 even see him how he, he knows that he's insecure because it is the whole like the Avengers and writing the book and and reading it. Not you, you can tell that there's a certain amount of his insecurity there, but he's actually thrilled with the fact that here is this partner that he has and that life is good. And then you do see the trickle down in terms of you know what happens with Cassie, where it's like, oh look it, and he's you know, and his kids managed to get herself into jail. What's up? Oh, wait a second. But instead of like filching things like he was doing before, like he it's was doing, okay, right, right. social justice stuff. <laughs> so she's in, she's yeah. in jail and, you know, she shrunk a police car and all this kind of stuff. And then you get that again, the conversation over pizza, cheap, cheap grandpa, I buy the small pizza so that I can put pin particles on it and get the extra large. Um, right. <laughs> not going to cook the thing, but I'm sure not paying for a full size one when I can upscale it myself. And there is an awesome, uh, once again, a blended family dynamic in this one. I would say one of the one of the things there were very few, but the, one of the things mm-hmm. I was disappointed about was we did not see mom and stepdad mm-hmm. at all. You know, at that last dinner, I was like, they really should be there. But you know, whatever. People still have different family events with different family, and so well, you know, and it seemed much more like the encapsulated family. Like yeah. let's just like mm-hmm. let's just keep it solid and not go in. You know, sure that other. You and, know, you know, I could see. I mean, it wouldn't have. I don't know. Whatever. Who knows? Uh, it wouldn't have. Uh, in my mind, been a huge deal to have them sitting at the table. I get it. But anyway, but the other part of that is that uh, you've got, you know, with Hope and Scott's relationship, and I I didn't pick up on, I don't know for sure if they're married, if they, you know, seem like they're together together, though. Yeah, yeah. Enough that she is in a stepmom role very much with Cassie, and you've got grandparents who are fully embracing, this is our granddaughter, which once again— healthy relationships and even Hank who's kind of an asshole in a lot of ways is just on board and and accepting that like yeah this is my granddaughter well, it's, it's, it's almost like Cassie is is Scott's redeeming feature like it's the I you know never been a big fan of you fine you're with my daughter but oh my, my god okay your daughter has got brain cells and I can you know if I can't if I can't work with you I can and, and then you see and, and he's taken her under his wing and he's just like oh, it's just stuff and I oh, wait a second quantum realm what and then you know, that's where grandma gets into the whole, like, on one <laughs> level, great to see that you're mentoring her. Oh, my God, what have you people done? <laughs> there is – and there's a great uh, – there's a great message throughout this whole thing that I think, yes, family, relationships, all that. But redemption was the big thing oh. that came to me, particularly the dynamic of uh, of abdication and then redemption, abdication mm-hmm. of duties. You got Cassie kind of coming down on Scott in a – uh, you know, you could argue one way or the other, and they do, mm-hmm. where she comes yeah. down and says, you've abdicated, maybe not in those words, but you've abdicated yeah. your responsibility as an Avenger. You like to trade off the idea of being a superhero and Avenger, and that's where you wrote your book and your podcast yeah, yeah. and everything. I love that he's a podcaster, by the way. Yeah. And um, – <laughs> And you know what? He'd be the kind of podcaster that would get all those like crazy, you know, he wouldn't just get 
Squarespace sponsorship. He was mm. one of those ones that would get McDonald's sponsorship. Let's be honest. Yeah. Anyway. So oh, he would take everything because it would be some, <laughs> and some, you know, it, some sort of validation. Like, I mean, you again, know, be all, the, all that time, like, I'll let people think that I'm Spider-Man if it gets me free coffee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, you're the uh, bug guy. You're the other bug guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he'd be on the Maximum Fun or Earwolf Network. One of those big networks. Anyway, a little yeah. podcasting uh, insider for everybody. But she tells him, you've given up. You're not doing the things you should be doing. Mm -hmm. And then we also, if I throw in there with Janet, she did also abdicate, you could say, the responsibility or the opportunity, at least, to be open with the family and say, here's this whole world down there. (laughs) That I, yeah. even if, even if it was like, I can't, you know, even if I don't believe I can go back and save them, there yeah. is this whole thing down there. And she's in it. I'm, I don't know that, uh, the old timey, they were pre Avengers in this universe, but you know, she's a superhero too, you know, wasp yeah. and ant man. That's how she got down there is, is sacrificing herself to save people. And, and she definitely worked as a, a hero, you know, Avengers level down there while she was there. Well, to then give and up. had the similar kind of thing where, again, thought you were doing the right thing, thought you were doing, oh boy, I've just been gaslit by <laughs> Absolutely. somebody with their own issues. Yeah. Oops. And, you know, <laughs> realizing that having done a good thing to help this person was sure. not going to have the impact you thought it was. <laughs> there's, and there's a redemption that's in there as well that I would say redemptive arc that I would think of as a uh, sort of under the radar kind of mm-hmm. a, a redemption, which is in the very beginning, Hank is using his technology rather than in the other two movies. I think there was a mm-hmm. huge emphasis on proprietary holding on to it. And it's like, yeah, I've okay, yeah. got this ultimate thing. We can use it to punch bad guys. And really, you know, this is my stuff. I'm the genius. Yeah. And, and a lot of it had to do with protecting the tech. And then, you know, in the first movie, it was almost all about protecting the tech from the wrong yeah. hands. So you could say for the greater good. On the other hand, it's, you know, Hank's. Well, and, and to watch but, how the ants would go down yeah. and then they would come back up and it's like, and it's the whole, oh, they've, they've lived like, you know, millions of years in a day kind of thing. They've evolved. And, you know, I know socialism is like a loaded word, but we can learn a lot from them. They're, they're, they're basically this techno socialist, yes. you know, society. And, and that, you know, in, so in a sense, they went off on their own outside of him and his proprietary stuff. Yes. Good point. But, yeah. And he's using. And then they come back. He's also using it to do all the things that people used to say, um, you know, like, oh, why doesn't he use it to feed the world? Why doesn't he use it for this? And it sounds like in the beginning they're talking about that the Hank Pym particles are being used to for some of those humanitarian reasons, which yeah. uh, which is very cool to see. That, to me, is a redemption arc to where Hank is like, let me actually give back. He's been bitter. Yeah. He's been lonely. He lost his wife doing good and you know he just hasn't hasn't been there and so that yeah. that's one he doesn't lose the grumpy old man vibe but yes. he's yeah he, but he's not carrying the same baggage like he's still got the grumpy old man vibe yes. but with a totally different bent or again like you say the redemption yeah yeah and i think that that's and, and part of it that you know we look at there is when i think janet and scott around the same time you know they get down into that micro world which, by the way, one of the things I really have loved, a lot of people really haven't cared for some of the recent Marvel things, but I've really enjoyed them delving into Marvel's weird aspects of the universe. Oh, my God. Well, yeah. And I loved how the fact there was a totally different aesthetic. Yes. It was like this weird, very, yeah. like, again, biological, organic, gooey, like the, the visuals were very different. And like you say, it's, it's that weird, trippy yeah. stuff. That um, yeah, it's 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 not all glossy machines and and you know yeah. high high tech. It's like there's I have holes. I yes. have holes. <laughs> drink yeah. these. The, um, you know, <laughs> the drink these. Yeah, that's uh, it. That that's the opportunity then the the Janet and Scott have to then pick that mantle back up and say we're in a place where people need help now. Mm-hmm. Nothing against, you know, you can't really beat up on Janet for this because how, you know, it wasn't her homeland. She did a lot of good there. But you can see where the people were hurt, just similar to, you know, I mean, similar to anything. If if there's Avengers around, you know, do they come to Captain Marvel style? Do they go look out for 
cruise the universe I, I, looking for people I think it goes back to, to your whoopsie thing. Right? Like the first yeah. act of any good superhero is um, a whoopsie moment where <laughs> <Yes. laughs> they inadvertently do something that um, goes wrong. And yeah. and I think that, well, and I what I love too about the quantum realm is that in some respects, it's this idea of, we think about, um, you know, how we get caught up in our heads or we regret something. And it's always that idea of taking something that, you know, again, oh my God, I said something to so-and-so six weeks ago. How did I word that sentence the right way? And it's this idea that it's a microcosm of something else and yet it becomes its own universe. So in a sense, we create a whole universe over something that's literally microscopic. And then it becomes this other thing and it takes on this whole other life. And so to me, the quantum realm was a sort of microcosm of, um, of different kinds of, like again whether it's regret actions like even when um when scott starts to you know split apart into all of these different things and then they watch him come together and and then at the end with hope's help it just like and it was like well that's not supposed to happen and it's like well no because scott's always fought all of these things and now he's realizing what the goal is and so he can bring all of his conflicting things together and in a sense you know does the thing that's not supposed to be able to happen because that's one of his own little things so it was no it was it was brilliant and in terms of janet like it was again here she is stuck she sees somebody else that's stuck i'm going to help them the way I would hope they could help me. And it looks like I might be able to go back if, you know, whatever. And then it's like the, Oh God, I've just done a thing. And, and I think that's another part from a growth thing is that if we are in some sort of, uh, I'm I'm definitely learning this in terms of like unpacking and, and, and working through my own PTSD is that that's the sort of, sometimes you don't have the tools to do the things and you're just doing what you do. And so when you look back on something, it's not, Oh, I screwed up because I didn't, you know, didn't know what I was doing. or really think, No, no, you did the best that you could with the tools that you had at the time. And so you should, you know, it's, it's like holding yourself accountable with the, I can't, gee, I didn't build the Taj Mahal, you know, re, re, I didn't rebuild it perfectly. It's like, yeah, well, you had a rusty hacksaw and a broken hammer. You should be thankful you built anything. doesn't matter whether it's, you know, you're able to recreate the Taj Mahal to spec. It's it's the you you actually built a three story house pretty well, which is awesome in light of what you got. So like we don't look back that way. And I think that's the other part of it. It was the there's a regret there, but she was doing the best with what she had, not understanding the quantum realm, certainly not knowing who the heck Kang is, Um, (laughs) you know. Yeah. So no, she was down there. You know, she probably didn't even see Loki down there. Uh Yeah. (laughs) Um, and so to have, well, that's where you, you, you do have somebody coming in in, in the role of Kang who is uh, using the, obviously using power in an irresponsible and evil way. At the same mm-hmm. time doing so, as we see with a lot of these villains, they portray themselves and they look at themselves as the hero, right? Of like, now for him. Oh, yeah, it's always like, something's wrong with the world and we'll just do it my way and it'll yeah, be fine. Nobody yeah. gets it but me. You know, Thanos and the 50%, you know, the snap sure. or whatever. Like, you know, because apparently extinguishing 50% of, you know, life is going to solve. Um, and really, as as always, you know, it boils down to this idea of it's really about being the bully, being powerful, having that power of yeah. others. People say, I, and it's interesting because people say, well, why didn't Thanos just snap his finger and feed everybody instead of killing them? And I've always said, you know, that's actually a message that's built into it, in my opinion, uh, intended or not, I guess. But it's it's much cooler, first of all. He wouldn't be a bad guy, and we wouldn't have someone to fight in a superhero movie. That's the real narrative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's but, like, why did that happen? Plot point. Because well, you know, we, yeah, we wouldn't no to be bad. It's <laughs> like, hey, stop feeding everyone. Um, but, you know, we find out which of the Avengers are against uh, socialism and welfare. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, you know, you get oh. into, though, the, the fact that he didn't really want to save the universe. He wanted to be a god. Right. So that was his thing. And and that's the other part of it, too, is it's not just about plot. It's about, no, there are people that are like this in the real world. And I think that's that other part, too, that people, oh, comics are all this and that and they're whatever. It's like, no, no, no. Uh, Whether the the comic books or in the movies, there's metaphors for other things here. Yes. And, and, you know, people will more soonly, sooner recognize it, you know, or maybe I think some folks are losing it because you're having to, like, remind people in these little memes that, you know, Star Trek was actually woke from the very first it episode back right, in the right, 60s. Right, exactly. it, it didn't become this way last week. And it's the same thing with comics is that, you know, and these stories that there's a lot of social messages in there. 
And that yes, just because there's boom, kapow, and whatever else in the in the frame doesn't make it any less important. And then in some respects, that can, is what makes it an effective message because it's not being lorded over your, you know, held over your head as here is a moral that is trying to be taught to you. It, you get caught up in the story and it organically, yeah. you know, gets, you know, it gets embedded. It's, it's, it's which much more subtle than, you know, mom sticking jam or sugar or peanut butter on top of, you know, the medicine you don't want to take. <laughs> I, know, it's a lot stealthier than that. It's, whipped into the yogurt. Um. <laughs> the, the the interesting thing for me is there's, you know, we see the journey there where, uh, from Scott's perspective, he goes from this, in his mind, basically in the beginning of the movie, basically he looks at it as a almost retired superhero. Mm-hmm. He's there like, hey, why aren't you out there doing hero stuff? He's like, well, I saved the world. Yeah, it's I'm all like, done. Oh, well, you know, I, I loved... Uh, uh, Hank's react. He's like, oh, really? Wow, I hadn't heard that. That never comes up. Uh, he never <laughs> mentioned it. But then one of the interesting things I noticed is that he, and and abdicating where we're, our responsibilities, let me back up and just say, I think a lot of times that comes from fear and intimidation. And here's somebody mm-hmm. who, uh, you know, not because, uh, not necessarily because of superheroing, but he lost five years with his daughter. He, mm-hmm. you know, he was able to help to fight off this great, you know, he helped to invent the time traveling that allowed them to go and just all of those things that he was able to do. And there's that fear of like, I came right up to the bridge, they're right up to this edge. I helped this team. We did this wonderful thing. You know, life's okay right now. I can look around mm-hmm. and just not look too hard and and say, I don't owe everybody that. I need to be here for my kid. Mm-hmm. And then... And of course, great power, great responsibility, as we know, Marvel yeah. message. So yeah. when he gets into this dangerous situation, I I felt like there was this path to where he started doing Ant Man stuff and hero stuff. Uh, he did it at first to save and protect his family, reunite mm-hmm. everyone, protect Cassie largely, and then there was an evolution there to where at some point he starts investing in we got to save these people. We got to save yeah. this world. We got to stop this guy. He's yeah, it's, now it's fully. Bigger. He's back, right? Yeah, exactly. He's yeah. out of retirement, so to speak. And I was curious what you thought of that journey for him of his changing motivations. Oh, I mean, I mean, definitely. Like I said, he came from that, especially too. When you think about it, I mean, he's always come from a place of insecurity, and of course, the way Hank, you know, talks to him is, <laughs> you know, yeah. not exactly a confidence builder, you know. And, you know, so um, definitely, and and that he'd found this, this comfort, but I think that's the other part too, is I think it was really, you know, having accomplished these things. And in some respects, it wasn't that reflection of, gee, I don't know how I got here. And it's almost like, again, that thing about, talked about this before, as soon as the hero gets to the place where they get to go, ah, (laughs) happy place. Oh, look at curveball. You know, let's have some pizza. Let's get sucked into the quantum well realm. Uh, you know, <laughs> boom. Um, you know, little family adventure that we weren't. You know, family. You know, dinner turned into you know again family adventure. So it was that thing where yeah, it, it was the um, oh yeah, I get to have some me time. I get to do this. I'm not. I've overcome sort of in, in some respects the respects the guilt associated with again what time he'd lost in jail and all these other kinds of things. And, and, you know, gee, I'm not at, 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 at Baskin Robbins anymore. And, but yeah, it's that weird thing. Where it's about that crossing a fine line, right? That idea of, okay, does he get to, is he enjoying it? And, and yes, they're taking some me time and some self care, or has he gone just a little further into that abdicating responsibility, not, you know, co- just coasting rest, the proverbial resting on his laurels and yes, his track record. That's a great point. And, and then the wake up call that happens when there's the consequences of all. And, and well, and that's the part too, that whole getting sucked into the quantum realm is not just a consequence of, you know, him as a parent with Cassie. It's, not, it's about the consequences of a bunch of different things where, oh, this person started, you know, gee, you're teaching your granddaughter what? And, oh, well, wait a second. Yeah, but you wouldn't know that not to teach her this and that because, oops, I didn't mention this other thing because I didn't think it was going to have a consequence. And so you you suddenly have all of these, it's all of these different threads come together and that lead to, oops, that moment. That just, you know, and that just hit me as you're saying, both for Janet and for Scott, 
Cassie is the one that opens the way for their redemption. Isn't that interesting? Because mm-hmm. here's Cassie being like, I'm going out and being a hero. I'm inventing this thing to affect the quantum realm, blah, blah, blah. And they're both like, no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And it's like, now, certainly there is an element of they do kind of know what they're talking about. On the same mm-hmm. token, there is that uh, sometimes that that hating on the young generation for being, you know, and I, I, I always think of it as like we teach our kids, you know, and for the last many generations, people who are good hearted people, they teach their kids like, hey, be more accepting, be more inclusive than my parents were, be more supportive, mm-hmm. be more community oriented. And then almost always yeah. there's an element of like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, hold on. No, I didn't Except mean that. Except for here. I didn't mean yeah. there. I didn't yeah. mean those people. I didn't mean this. I didn't mean that. You know, I'm uncomfortable now. Yeah. Or, and then the next generation. Or, or challenge us already. <laughs> Except for mine. Yeah. Except for mine. Yeah, don't, definitely. I'm, I'm sending you out there to be progressive thinker. and change but, the world. Just, yeah. But in these four walls, I'm the boss. <laughs> and so, you know, there is that that uh, dynamic of where I, that's where I think we need I say we now being, uh, you know, past a certain age, you say we instead of us or with uh, we means old parents in my mind now. Yeah. I'm one of them. And so you look and say, <laughs> yeah. we need that younger generation to poke us and have that energy. And they need us to kind of guide and say, as we saw even in this movie, when they start heroing, Scott obviously has things to teach her because he knows how to ant person, ant man, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> he knows how to. Uh, shrink and fight and grow and fight and and so yeah you see that kind of like that that all working together and cassie is activating them to action right to to do yeah, something yeah yeah well and even when she goes to rescue um oh what's her name uh, is it jendetta and, and anyways yeah. and it's the whole like okay so fine you've you know you rescue me what's your plan uh, that's kind of like where, like the plan was to get you. <laughs> that was it. Like you know. <laughs> yes, that was it. I, so she's she's you know so she's in her early heroing, um, but you see, I mean, but that, that's the other thing is she is a catalyst, and I think that's the other part that's interesting because there are again these social messages that are in there. I mean, you know, again the, the social democrat in me, you know, is like, <laughs> oh my god. So we've got the you know again you've got, you've got the ants for starters. You've got the folks that have basically become refugees in their own territory under a dictator. And how they rise up, but just all the different things that keep happening, getting pushed down. And so the fact that she, you know, she starts off with, again, I got arrested for doing social justice work. I wasn't trying to like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't being light fingered with something (laughs) um, the way her dad might've been in the past. Um, So I was doing something for a reason. I put the cops in their place and, you know, I did give him back his car. I did give him back (laughs) his police car. Oh, I found this, you know, little Hot Wheels thing. And so, you know. So I think that's the other part too, is that a lot of times, um, and I've seen this myself and I've, and it, again, you, you experience different parts of it where you're part of a generation where yes, you're pushing the boundaries and you're, you know, speaking out about somebody, you know, and, and somebody that, you know, well, you're not as progressive as, you know, you, you thought you were and da, 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 and you're like, you know, you got to watch yourself because there's nothing to say that 20 years later, you're going to be in this other place and people are going to be calling you out. So mm-hmm. as long as you keep growing and and you are willing to learn from the previous generation. And I think that was the other part that we saw was that there was this willingness to learn again. It didn't come easy, but we saw it right. Like mm-hmm. even from Hank and Janet and, you know, so yes, there's the original, like we're the grown ups thing that they start all start off on. And then as things go, there's like a recognition of, Oh, wait a second, Scott can actually contribute something or oh, whatever. The, the, there's a recognition in Cassie that the younger folks have something that they can teach them as well. And and in some respects, I would argue, even bring them back to their original core values that got them started. And that I think one of the best lines was, I mean, so you get, you know, the opening and him reading the book and, oh, but there's always room to grow. Mm -hmm. So you get Scott putting that out there. And then, you know, you get her, uh, you know, you get Cassie when she's dealing with Darren and the whole, you know, it's never too late to stop being a dick. <laughs> yes, that's <one laughs> which is the, which the is really a crasser way of saying the same thing. Like it's not just about growth; you can actually change. Yeah. And that, to me, that was one of the best redemption, like the funniest redemption arcs right. ever. Whereas he goes, like, because again, like talk about somebody that is um, caught up in his vengeance and and well and again and all of these things where we have this microcosm and and in some respects like how modok looks it's his head because he's caught like his head is just filled 
with all of the things that he feels have been taken away from him, that he's, you know, all the vengeance, all the whatever. So literally he's got no body left. He's got to be this because it's just a head full of, of rage, vengeance and whatnot. And then in the end, she's like, just the, like, you got to stop being a dick. Like, and yeah. there's, you know, it's, well, yeah, but that's all I've ever been. No, no, no. There's, it's never too late. And then in the end, how he comes to this place where it's like, oh, I am not, a, you know, like saving. I'm Darren and I'm not a dick and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I'm dying an Avenger. And it's like, yeah, you know what? If that's what you need to believe, Darren, yeah. we will see you off as an Avenger. But well, the point is he came around, even if it was at the last minute. And this is, and this is where you see when there is a system of people, community, family, whatever that means for each person, there mm-hmm. is the uh, there's the forgiveness, right? We find forgiveness yeah. oftentimes, and even him, who boy, there's a lot of reason to just be like, oh, you're dying now. Well, you know, screw you. Um, yeah, and, but that's not a heroic way to handle it. But yeah. there, there just is. Let him think whatever you not. Oh, I like a brother to you. Sure, I was. And it's <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> There's often t- right, right. It's kind of like that, that yeah, dynamic. Yeah, you're, you're, you're uh, the you were the doofusy little vengeful yes. little brother. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You see that dynamic. Yeah, that you see, you know, where, like uh, you know, every, yeah. Everybody's a night uh, yeah. a wonderful person after you know they die or when they're in. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but it, no, it really is where you know when you reach out for that and you make a real redemption, whether it's him, obviously, you know, he sacrificed, he lays down his life to try to yeah. take out the bad guy, and then uh, you see the same thing then uh, with Scott, where he ultimately is willing to sacrifice himself yeah. and his life. And even if he survives his access to his family, because I don't know that he knows that they somehow just opened the door again. Anyway, whatever. But <laughs> so that he didn't know that they could do that. I don't think. Yeah. Um, and he thought, you know, he thought, and I think many audience members, we also thought, Oh, because retirement for superheroes often means death. And, you know, we're going to get, I, I'm going to yeah, mention a lot yeah. more and about it was like, that. Oh gosh. Are, yeah. are, are Scott and, and hope just stuck in the quantum realm now. And, Rich, you know, better than I was dying, but still, yeah. one of the turning points for that that you can see is when he starts to allow Cassie to be a part of this. And that all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you know, or, or gradually as they're going forward, he lets Cassie use her abilities and her dynamic energy to say she's going to be fighting too. And this might be a yeah. strange thing to compare it to. I'm, I'm remembering uh, the words of like John Brown, for anyone out there who knows the American abolitionist, John Brown. They just released a mm. miniseries a couple of years ago called The Good Lord Bird, um, I believe, and it, where Ethan Hawke plays him, who is a, a very colorful character in in mm. U.S. history. Who He was a, a, a believer that that slavery had to be ended by violent overthrow, that there had to be amends made, that mm-hmm. even even amends in terms of blood atonement uh, by yeah. the U.S. to say we, we need to fight and even kill slave owners, you know. So that's, you know, yeah. that is what it is, and people can whatever. But one of the things that he that I'd read, he was quoted as uh, many of, several of his sons gave up their lives in this cause, in his militia that he mm-hmm. formed. And when he was asked about that grief and that pain, it was very painful, but he said he was proud that his sons had been willing to lay down their lives in a cause that they believed in and they believed in. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a little heavy and actually a thing that really happened in real life, so I don't mean to make a comparison. Yeah. But basically, narratively, and in the story, we're seeing this ability to, you know, there's there's an empowerment to watch our kids say, that I'm going to take part in this. And it's like, ooh, and and for most of us, it's not being destroyed by a time traveling warlord. For most of us, it's more oh, they're going to be mean to you. Oh, you're going to get mm-hmm. calling attention to yourself, and and you're going to get hurt. Or what if you're going on a protest and you get tear gassed, or you know, someone mm-hmm. heaven mm-hmm. forbid, you get killed or really hurt. Well, and and I think that's that thing about the the larger sense of of apathy that's out there. I mean, I know one of the things you know in, in terms of some sort of recent things that have happened this this year. I mean, I had stuff coming up on my social media related to um, protests going on in Israel and stuff going on in France, because I have, you know, people that I know there and they're uploading their stuff. And, and somebody that I know that also had, has folks in both places um, was coming across on a very sort of, you know, I would say, you know, conservative perspective of, oh my gosh, we have to stop all of this because of all of the things that are happening. And you're like, okay, well, for starters, both of those protests in both of those places are happening because 
government is not listening and and that any elements of things that were coming up that were again this person was you know it was the whole let's get all worried about the violence and you're like anytime a lot of this stuff happens you you get a lot of people that'll come in and um amp things up in a way that they're not really part of the cause just to you know tap into exactly that and so what i was like you know what you got to understand that there are some people that are going to come in there and do that i said what worries me more is the fact that there are other places in the world where the same or worse is going on and people are just letting it go and that there's they're not standing up against whatever so i understand that this yes it has some things and yes i am worried about the well-being of whatever but you know what I've lived in Paris during like strikes and during all, all the stuff that was happening. I, I was there in the eighties long before, you know, nine 11. So anytime the U S did something, Oh, look at, there's the FNAC. I mean, I showed my kids the FNAC record store that got blown up around the corner from my friend's house yeah. as a retaliation for what was going on. So there was Libyans, you know, there's different things going on in the politics at the time. So it's like, you know what, like I've lived and, and you know, if it, if it's Paris and you've gone six weeks without a grève, without a strike, some kind of social, like something's wrong. You know, so <laughs> wow. okay, so they're burning garbage. Why are they? Burning? So this idea of like you said that there's consequences, but it's like, what are the consequences really? And in some respects, are the consequences of sitting around doing nothing and letting whatever this is and get worse? To me, that's you know, I can live with a couple of weeks of burning garbage, or I can live with you know, I'm. I'd rather put my life on the line so that things get better mm -hmm. than just sit by and go, well, not affecting me, not affecting my nine to five daily, whatever. So I think that was the other part too. And, and that even came with, again, with the ants, you know, so you, you saw how they worked with those folks, how they helped those folks get over that. We're just trying to survive. We're just trying to survive. Like that kind of, you know, right. you know just keep hiding off in corners and staying alive. As, as opposed to, well, no, or we can, we've got some backup now, let's stand up, fight, and let's see if we can make it better. And, you know, I think they do. Now, again, there's the larger thing of, okay, you know, we, <laughs> but that even comes up at the end where you have him with the, this is great, this is wonderful. And then, oh, but did I accidentally, <laughs> oh, he said there's more coming. And so, like, to me, like, the, the three lines in that film are always, the, again, always room to grow. You know, it's never too late to stop being a dick, but also don't overthink it. And one you of the, <laughs> one of the great absolutely one of the one of the great things about that is there's always room to grow. I think the very first time it's used, I I chuckled at it and laughed like, oh, he's a yeah. he's a shrinking and growing yeah, superhero. That, course, yeah. Ha ha! There's always room to grow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So cheesy, and he's just selling his book. But then I think, and and I think this is very well done because it morphs throughout the thing to being like, yeah, there is always room to grow. Yes, you know. And mm -hmm. One of the things that's super powerful about that, I believe that I, I believe that sometimes we get embarrassed about sincerity, right? And that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. why there's always room to grow could be a joke in the beginning, and then you realize yeah. it's really not a joke, not at all. It's actually very, you know, it's a, it's a very when you mean it, it's actually a pretty deep concept. Yeah. And so oftentimes though, we're a little too cool for school when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. And say, yeah, how yeah. comfortable can I be with that level of sincerity to just say, yeah, there is always room to grow. And that's powerful. It's powerful in my life and in all of our lives. Well, and, and that sometimes, again, going to that, sometimes when we grow, that means we leave people and ideas and places behind. And that sometimes our growth can actually threaten people. Mm hmm. They are intimidated, and whether that's by intellectual growth. So we have, I mean, because we do have in Western society a very, especially here in North America, very anti-intellectual thing. Oh, well, you know, so-and-so's got a degree in this and that. And it's like, no, 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 no. Again, not everybody needs to go to, you know, post-secondary and we don't all need to have dead PhDs behind our, our name. But at the same time, if you've got an anti-intellectual perspective, um, and, and then none of us grows. And, yes. and that you, in a sense, when people pride themselves on their ignorance, um, you know, <laughs> problematic on so many levels both individual so that's the other part is that sometimes i, I and again especially if you're coming from a dysfunctional family yeah. you know the, the the person who is most likely you know the, the person that's most likely to become the black sheep or the scapegoat is the person who you know is pointing out things and is on a growth path that challenges the status quo of that little ecosystem and so 
you do get a, you know, in a sense, an anti-intellectual, anti-growth perspective and that you get picked on for growing. And so, you know, that's it. So I, I do see the growth metaphor there exactly like you like throughout in different ways. And even the fact that at that one point where it's the, oh, you're big and they give each other hugs, you know, as as big, you know, <laughs> because, and to me, that again, that's that sort of growth. He's grown as a father. She's grown as a superhero and they're acknowledging each other as peers. And then of course it turns into the whole thing about citrus. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know? and ultimately too, can we really, can we really hold together and protect those we love without staying true to whatever values we live by and yeah. the role that we play in being authentic in our own lives, you know, as they are when the the hero comes out of all of them. So, well, and especially too, when you think about Scott, like even his, you know, his initial transgressions, you know, that he got him into jail was it was about on some level he wanted to provide for his daughter, and he wasn't doing it well, and so you know, and so he, so it wasn't like he was, you know, he, he was doing what he thought he had to do. But again, like so many other situations, when you don't have the opportunity, the tools, the whatever. And the only choices you're being offered are bad choices. Um, then you're and you're picking the lesser of the evils in trying to do something good. Like that's the place that he was in. And so that's the other thing is that you know he was given like Hank gave him opportunities that he didn't have otherwise. And that's I think the other part of like it's, I would say like Scott's larger redemption arc is he's gone from you know being that guy that was making whatever choices you know he felt were in front of him to, okay, yeah, he's doing these other things now. And in, maybe in some respects, that whole kind of coasting, whatever almost comes from everything he's gone through and never thinking he would get there. And just like, I just want to sit back and enjoy this because it wasn't supposed to happen. You know? <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.